We're twins, by the way. Yeah, we are twins. So yeah. shirts. I realized that when uh, I walked into the gym and saw your shirt. I was like, Ooh, yeah. It's a good I thing. figured. I mean, it's not that I, I don't wear these, but I can wear them more often. So um, they're just sitting in my closet. It's like, oh, I might as well. <laughs> wear them. Yeah. I notice mean, you always wear them on podcast day, which I like. It's like, oh, it's not. It's honestly not been calculated at all. It's just, um, just kind of, I guess, luck of the draw. Podcast outfit. Um, let me see here. Let me get a piece of paper. Probably shouldn't do someone way better than this. <laughs> so, no, yeah, don't do that. I use a prior in-body. A prior yeah, in-body sheet? Yeah, I have them here. So, Got it. Um, how are you today, Josh? Good. I'm, uh, I've, I've stopped sweating profusely. I'm still sweating, just yeah. not profusely. Yeah. So that reminds me, remind me to spray this chair down whenever I leave today. Okay. Yeah, because there's going <laughs> to be a heavy dose of... I think the term bodily fluid is one of the most disgusting terms out there. And I was I was gonna use it to describe what I felt like I was imparting on this chair. Yeah. And I guess I kind of did. But then I was like, I don't want to say that. But I do feel obligated to say my thoughts about that statement. I think that we have a responsibility to keep this. Let's say I'm gonna put it in quotes as PG as possible. Yes. Um. But I think. Nowadays, people have made the term bodily fluids as disgusting as yes. It is. Because any normal person would be like saliva, snot, tears, sweat, sweat, sweat. like yeah, they, yeah tears, things that don't like tears. This, yeah, yeah, tears make people cry. Yeah, those things don't gross me out that much. But when you bring yeah. up like oh, good blood or whatever it's become right. now, like that term, just just don't say it. Just say. Sweat. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 Bodily fluids. Yeah. Sweat and snot. Plus, being more descriptive, I think, adds a little bit of oomph to the story. So I'm excited. We got a lot of good questions today. Yeah, man. It looks like so, we got four of them. Yeah. Which means this podcast is going to be three hours long. <laughs> yeah. Strap in. Yeah. We have since we're going every other week now. We have uh, an hour and give it five minutes from last week to make up. So yeah. Double down. No, just kidding. We won't be that long. Um. So, upcoming events, we'll yeah. cover that first. Okay. Number one, well, the only one that I, well, no, no, there's two, actually. Yeah. There's uh, not this Saturday, so not a couple of days from today, but the following Saturday, June 26th, Coach Ed is doing his Strong Fit Clinic, uh, appropriately subtitled Sandbags and Sleds, a little hint if you're wondering what you're going to be learning that day. No yellow carries and stones. That's right. This is sandbags and sleds. Sandbags and sleds, and that's from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. I know there's only a handful of spots left, so if you're thinking about jumping into that and you're kind of on the fence, I would recommend just going ahead and getting your spot secured. Yep. And then the other one, I will let you give the details because they're probably more fresh in your mind about what Coach Steph is doing. Yeah, so on Saturday, July 10th, uh, from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. again, Coach Steph is hosting a nutrition clinic. Uh, and so the subject or the title topic of this one is Meal Prep 101. And so uh, come and spend two hours learning about meal prepping, meal prepping and how, um, of course, like how to do it and what it's used for. But I think more importantly is in the clinic, I'm, I mean, I'm guessing you're going to talk about how it can be applicable towards you and your goals. So like, Correct. is meal prepping right for you? It most likely is. I don't think there's a single person that it doesn't work well for mm -hmm. um, in some way, shape or form, but how can you apply it for yourself and your goals to kind of um, help you live your life and reach your goals a little bit better? Um, so the tagline I've kind of been saying in class is there isn't really a single person or anybody in particular, like individual person or archetype of person that doesn't benefit from meal prepping in some way. So I feel like the meal prep 101 is the perfect nutrition clinic to kind of host and have, you know, to kind of bring people in and teach them about that. So that's on Saturday, July 10th, 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Yeah, if you've got more specific questions, I'll definitely reach out to Steph for information on that. But uh, just just knowing kind of the background, watching her put it together, I know that there's there's going to be um, a plenty of takeaways that will help you personalize meal prep or planning for your specific lifestyle, your family, and, and what works best for you. So. 
Um, yeah, I, I think it is highly beneficial for anybody. Yeah, for sure. If you are a human that eats, you will benefit from this. What if you are on the juice diet and you just do juices? You probably need to learn how to eat and chew your food, so you should come. <laughs> you got a really weak job. Yes. Um, okay, so we got four of them. We got four listener questions today. We did this a few episodes ago, and I like this. I, listen, I kind of want to recap all of them. Yep. Um, and then like we'll ahead just, of time. Yeah. And then, and then we'll, okay, we'll just hop into it. Okay. Um, so we have four listener questions. Number one is this kind of a two-part question. Why do my wrist hurt when I front squat? Um, following that up with, uh, how can I make my front rack better? So talking about a little bit of mobility stuff there in terms of movement. Uh, number two is how quickly can a person lose muscle? Uh, this is something that uh, Hunter asked you. Um, and of course he said it depends. So of course we'll get into that. I think right. people should come to expect that answer. Number three is why does 70% of my one rep max lift, whatever that lift may be, right. feel harder than my 100% or my actual one rep yes. max? Yes, um, lots to unpack there. I want to talk to that person um, because right. I, I want to I want to run right back. <laughs> Wait a minute, I'm going to that plan. <laughs> yeah. um, and then number four, um, kind of following up with that question is, what is the difference between absolute strength and muscle endurance? Um, and then we have a little bit of an answer there um, that we'll get into. So, yeah, those are the four that we're kind of looking at today. Cool. Um, so... I guess with that being said, we will hop into LQ number one that I write on the sheet. So, um, first one is, why do my wrists hurt, Josh, when I front squat? So, this is probably going to be the most straightforward answer, although inevitably we're going to stretch the conversation out a little bit. It depends. So, yeah, I'm not going to say that it depends. I would say that it hurt, your wrist hurt when you front squat simply because it's getting put into a position, it, it being your wrist, your body, but your wrist in particular are getting put into a position that it can't express pain-free at that moment. Got it. So, and you could refer to it as flexibility, mobility, but in my experience, and I'll you know obviously ask you as well if, if you've seen this in the time that you've been coaching, but in my experience, the vast majority of people that have wrist pain, specifically in terms of when they front squat and getting into that front rack, they don't actually lack wrist mobility. What they typically lack is something in the shoulder, something in the lat that doesn't actually allow their flexibility in the wrist to be expressed. Okay. Right? So they can't get into that good front rack position. So because of that, the wrist ends up taking a ton of the pressure of the weight that is that it is asked to be supportive of. Does that yes. make sense, the words that I kind of jumbled together there at the end? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so um, the easiest way to think of it is like, why do my wrist hurt? Because there's, there's too much pressure for them to not hurt, right? And you can't, you could say, oh, well, they're not strong enough. Well, strong enough relative to who? So, Rob Rivera's wrists are going to be way stronger than my wrists just on like a pounds per square inch, you know, very thinly veiled look at it, right? Right. However, I might, you could potentially make the argument that I could support more weight comfortably in the front rack than Rob could. Yes. Potentially, yeah, right? Potentially. Now, like if I'm just simply not strong enough to hold the weight into the front rack, well, that's another you know, conversation for another day, but when it comes to say, let's, let's both load up 100 kilos into the front rack and who can hold it there and not have any pain in the front rack, it actually might be me, even though, quote unquote, his wrists are stronger because, and, and I'm just picking him just because he and I have had worked on this for a really long time, um, specifically with his front rack, but he just might not be able to get into a position. So his wrists are bearing the brunt of that, and that just hurts. There's just pain there. So, like you said, a, a common fix I'll go to is when somebody's front squatting, um, and say it's really, really painful, and we might set them up with like a back squat or something instead, but in between their back squat sets, 
I might have them do some sort of wrist mobility in between. Yeah. Um, so if normally a tell that I see is if they're if that's difficult for them, or right, they, it's apparent they don't have that kind of mobility, that could be the issue. But you're saying that, hey, like, if they have the mobility, it could be like your bladder, your tricep is so tight that yeah. now your wrist can't express the mobility that it has right. to hit that position. Interesting. Yeah. And it's, I, I know that people, if you're just listening to this, you couldn't see what I'm doing, but it's like if. If you can't get past where your elbows are in, in like coming up in front of the frontal plane of your body and getting nice and tall, well then you can see that like all this weight would be bearing right down on my wrist. Right. Whereas when I can get up into this position, it, it actually sits there and is supported by my you know my collarbone, my front rack, my shoulder, and stuff like that. Yeah. Right. So you know I, I don't know if the camera can really show this, but. I always compare my wrist flexibility with somebody else's that is saying like, hey, I'm getting a lot of pain there and it's because of my wrist. And I say, well, show me how far you can go back this way, right, into flexion and extension. And inevitably, they can do just as much as I can, if not more. And they're like, huh, well then what's going on? I'm like, yeah. okay, well, let's, let's try to get into the front rack. Oh, well, okay, that's, that's really what's going on. So, well, the segue is right uh, into the second part of this question is how can you make the front rack better? So like how can you capitalize on everything that you just said? Yeah. So going back to your point, which I think is, I'm, I'm not dismissing at all, I think it's super valid. There, there are individuals that their wrists just don't get a lot of flexion and extension throughout the day. So doing some wrist stretching, if you know you're going to be put into maybe a little bit more um, uh, uh, more positions than you're not normally in in an everyday scenario, definitely spend some time doing those wrist stretches that you were talking about. Yeah. The other area is lengthening you know, the lat out a little bit, so doing some of the front rack stretches that we do where you're le leaning up against the upright, you know, with the tricep kind of sitting against the upright and really stretching that lat out a little bit because if it's tight, it's just simply not going to relax enough, you know, to allow you to get into that good front rack. So that would be another um, kind of along with that. When you do that specific stretch, you are actually going to get into stretching the tricep out a little bit as well. So that's that's another one. And then just everything up here from like your scalings and your neck into your traps and the anterior part of your shoulder. So spending time, whether it's a lacrosse ball, like you have us do a lot at the four class. If it is, you know, um, getting into a foam roller or something like that, just opening that area up so that it can actually get into a good position to improve that front rack. That's crazy talk. Massage my neck so that my wrist feels better. What are these guys talking about? So something that I heard years ago, I think it was, I don't know if it was Kelly Starrett or somebody else in that PT mobility space, but. Something that I remember hearing and it stuck with me to this day is that the, the site of your pain is uh, very often not the source of your pain. Hmm. So if my knee hurts, it's, it, it's probably not because there's something wrong with your knee. So you look upstream and downstream. So if my yeah. knee is hurting, I'm going to look at my hip and my ankle, right? If my hip is hurting, I'm going to look at my knee and my you know, thoracic spine or my lumbar spine or something like that. Okay. So the side of pain is not necessarily the source of your pain. I'm not saying that it's not. Like if you twist your knee and you shred your ACL, <laughs> you're not looking at your hip. Yeah. Right? So just I want to toss it out there. Also, yeah. I want to toss out we're not physios. So. Yeah, we should probably throw that in there. Um, a, a long time ago, I was... Um, bring someone in through foundations, they were coming into the group class and they said, you know, I've seen um, CrossFit and CrossFitters on TV for so long, and even the, my friends that do it, you know, I've always noticed how big your guys' traps are, you know, it's, and it, just you talking about getting a lacrosse ball and massaging like the trap in the neck made me remember this, that it kind of made me realize after he had said that, I was like, yeah. And so we had kind of had a conversation. Like we do a lot of things like kettlebell swings. We do, do a lot of like pulling off of the floor at the time. We were doing a lot of like power snatches, power cleans, stuff mm -hmm. like that. To where your traps are so engaged, overhead stuff. So it makes sense that our traps would be so big. But what kind of comes along with that is, um, and 
I call it the bad stuff, but you know, like the bad stuff that comes along with that is like, okay, that's gonna be tighter, right? So we are doing a lot of pulling, even today, you know, dumbbell snatches and then some kettlebell swings, and then we might go overhead and we'll do some pushing tomorrow, right? So we're using a lot of like trap and upper back involvement, um, not to kind of single out the trap, but it's kind of said that for any body part, if you're no, your right. knee is bugging you, and this goes back to a conversation you and I were having before class, if you're not spending the time doing the pre and post workout kind of um, stuff that you need to, to be able to express what you want to, um, it, it could end up, you know, having the wrist pain in the front rack, but you could end up having a knee pain while you run because your hips aren't set or your trap isn't set. So, um, yeah, you just, you never really, I never realized, and I've been coaching for a couple of years at this point, how much a certain body part is being used until it's kind of pointed out to you. And so it's, yeah. kind, of, it's kind of cool to, to hear that and use that and apply that to um, further programming or coaching. Or yeah. So. The, the other thing that I will add that just popped into my mind that I wanted to make sure that we said about this is, um, is you, you have to actually do the movement right. Yeah. So if, if your mechanics are bad, like just the sheer mechanics of getting into a front rack, like if you are full, like death gripping the bar, trying to get it into the front rack, that's not going to work because you're, you're so tight, your wrist is not actually able to flex or extend. So, right. you know, if you can't open your hand up, you know, because if you do, the bar goes forward, well, guess what? That's not because of your wrist. That's because everything else is tight and doesn't allow your shoulder to flex the way that it should. Yeah. So, it, it comes down to mechanics really playing a big role too, which if you can't express the mechanics correctly, then probably go back and look at like, well, do you have the requisite flexibility and control in that range of motion? Yeah. Cool. Well, that's a good question. I've actually been, we, you know, we have front squats in this block, so we've been getting that one quite a bit, so it's cool to take some time. Yeah. Uh, all right, let's move on to number two because you and Hunter were talking about this. Um, Actually, it was not me. This is a question that was uh, submitted by one of the other coaches, so he didn't actually ask me. I know I so I just copied and pasted. Oh. Sorry. Okay, no, that's cool. I'm, I'm, but I'm glad. I hope Hunter's listening to the podcast. I hope he listens to this to get his answer. But how quickly can a person lose muscle? <laughs> Well, I do like that this coach, I think it was Stephanie actually that he was talking to about this, if I'm remembering correctly, but I do like that she gave the, the typical answer that nobody wants to hear, but is that it depends. Um, going a little bit further, what I would say, because I've experienced this and I think everybody, especially, you know, guys, you know, the, the younger that you are, especially like when you're first coming into your teens and through high school and early college years, you just, you think about putting muscle on. So I think we've all experienced this is you, you probably lose muscle faster than you would like to. Yeah. Right. So how quickly can a person lose muscle? Um, no, it's not going to happen overnight. Right, so we can we can rule that out. So it's not like if I don't lift weights and if I don't meet my protein goal today, I'm gonna wake up tomorrow with less muscle. So we we can we can like lay that aside. We could we could probably even lay aside that if you do that for two days in a row, if you don't exercise and do some sort of resistance training and you don't hit your protein goal and you don't move and your sleep is crappy and your stress is through the roof, so your cortisol is elevated and your testosterone drops out of the floor for two days, you're probably not going to lose any muscle. I think so many people just went, oh, okay, thank goodness. Yeah, like a, like a sigh of relief, yeah. right? Now, beyond that, I don't know. Maybe you can show me at the cellular level on the third day. I don't know. I can s certainly speak to this that it could definitely happen within a week to where you lose some muscle mass. Yeah. If, and I, I think the way to think about it is this, and we've talked about this ad nauseum, but the stress is put onto the body. If it is such that the body can adapt and recover and grow from it, you get better. So in the case of you know, putting on muscle, we call it hypertrophy, is like the technical term, right? So if you stress the body and then provide the right environment for it to grow muscle, then 
you are able to maintain that, that same level or maybe put a little bit more on. Now, when the either A, you are not putting the necessary stress on the body, it doesn't have to be a big stress, it just has to be a little bit more than what you did the previous time, but if, if the stress is not enough such that your body has to exhibit a stress response to it, then you're not putting it into the right state for growth. Or, which is usually what happens, is you are stressing the body more so than you have previously, but you are not providing the environment through nutrition, stress management, and sleep that will allow your body to either A, maintain, or B, gain muscle. Okay. Right? So, how quickly can a person lose it? It's probably not going to happen in a couple of days. You can definitely start to see the after effects um, for sure within a week. Now, how much do you lose? Are you going to lose a whole pound of muscle mass in a week? Eh, unless there's something like catastrophic going on, right? Maybe. In actuality, it might be a couple of ounces. Now, think about this. Over time, if this perpetuates a month, six months, a year, yeah, you can certainly lose a few pounds. But something that I, I want to make sure that we kind of hit on here, that we briefly uh, glossed over, this was a couple of months ago, it's, is it's not natural to continue building muscle throughout the course of your life. Like just from a biological, anthropological, evolutionary uh, survival perspective, it doesn't make sense. If you sit with that and think about, okay, why would I need to maintain or even grow muscle throughout my life, right? Because if you look at it from a purely survival standpoint, you don't want to be all big and muscle bound. If you think about weight millions of years ago, like roaming the plains, you don't want to be some big bulky dude because it takes a lot of energy to maintain that muscle. Yeah. And you have less energy to hunt and gather and kill, right? So there, there is that. So biologically speaking, you are going to hit a point, you know, probably for, you know, most humans, if, even if you stay physically active, it's going to be late 30s, early 40s, where you kind of see the peak. And then, <laughs> good term, it sounds so, um, it sounds so uh, depressing, but it's like you're resisting entropy. Like you're just resisting <laughs> death, right? It's like an onslaught, the, the resistance. So there, there is that. So there's, there's a lot to kind of think about there. How quickly can it happen? It's not going to happen in a couple of days. It can certainly happen in a week. But the thing to think about for you personally is how does your lifestyle today match what you were doing prior to, like if you did an in-body a year ago or a month ago, yeah. how have things changed? Has your activity level dropped? and everything else kind of remain the same, so I'm eating as much, well, that doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna lose it, you might, but there's just a lot to think about there. So I feel like I've rattled on for, I don't know, however many minutes, I wanna make sure I give you space to speak. No, that's good. Um, I, I think you said a lot, I, I just have a couple of questions. Um, really just one is it's something that I'm kind of interested in, and because, to me, of course, like muscle is aesthetically pleasing, right? By whatever standards we as a society have attached muscle to. I mean, the ancient Romans thought their fat kings were aesthetically pleasing, right? Because it meant wealth, right? So, but I think now we're in a place where society is, you know, you don't, you don't see, I mean, I guess nowadays you do, we don't have to get into it, but you don't see like heavier set like Instagram models, right? The, or Instagram like influencers, right? You see all the fit people but I realize that that is totally incorrect and that you do have the people like that. That's another conversation <laughs> that I think a lot of people and I would disagree on. Anyway, right. I, that's, that's, right. that's, that's all right. right. Hey, I, I, got, that. I got opinions, man. Yeah. <laughs> but I think for the most part, I'll say for, I would say the majority, which is 50% of the population plus one, the majority. Um, 
I like that. That's a great way to. The, okay, yes. I've never heard it because, expressed that way, but that's actually really good. Yeah. Yes. The majority doesn't mean ninety nine percent. No. It's fifty percent plus one. And people need to remember that. No, I'm gonna go <laughs> off on a rant real quick. People need to remember. Yes, that. Why do I got that in there? <laughs> people need to remember that when, like, we always say on here. For the most part, this is what happens physiologically and biologically. And you always say, there's that one person, oh, I'm a special snowflake. They don't have, oh, I know a person that did this. I know yeah. a person that did that. If you have 1,000 people, 501 of them is considered the majority. Yes. Right? If yes. you have an election, we won't get into the election, <laughs> but like, uh -oh, it's, it's got canceled. It, yeah, right? Yeah, <laughs> okay, we just got canceled. And 501 people vote for Josh and 499 vote for me. The majority voted for Josh, right? right? right. So right. yes, you might know 499 people, okay? So remember, the right. majority of people okay. think that muscle, I think nowadays, is aesthetically pleasing. Um, I get that. I'm concerned with strength, yes. right? So the application of that muscle, I guess, is what you could call strength. I don't know if that's how you define it, but of, um, theoretically, the more muscle you have, the more strength you're gonna have, and we'll get into that with muscle endurance. But what happens to strength? How, how quickly can a person lose strength, I would say maybe in correlation with that muscle, or mm -hmm. as opposed to that muscle? Is it similar? Like after a couple of days, you know, you might have uh, an Olympic weightlifter um, deload before a meet, and they'll come back, and they might be stronger on that Saturday they lift than they were on that yes. Wednesday or Thursday because their body's fresh. But what about the following Wednesday? If they were to rest totally for a week, what's happening to strength in that time that they're theoretically losing muscle on that cellular level? Yeah, that's a really great one. And sorry, it took so long to ask it. I went off on a few things. No, no, that was really good. I'm glad somebody did today. Um, so again, it it depends. So if you are somebody who is naturally, relatively speaking, like if you just take a, a broad swipe of the population and a, across a, a body of averages for strength testing, if you're just somebody who's, and you know if this is you, like you've just naturally been super strong all your life. Like I have no doubt that Robert Bear has always been a strong guy, Yeah. right? Now, if he just looks at himself strength today versus strength two years ago, it might be a little bit, uh, I think discouraging could be the word, right? Because he's, he's kind of rehabbing some things, but he's still a strong guy. Like I have no doubt that he could probably still deadlift more than I can, right? So if, if you are somebody who skews towards that just raw, primal strength, chances are that you are not going to see as a percentage of your overall absolute strength as big or aggressive or quickly of a drop off in that strength. Could it happen? Yeah. But in general, let's just say the majority, so 50% plus one, it's not going to happen. If you are, again, to, to take it back to like adolescent boys um, and then teenagers and, and you know college age guys, it would say hard gainers. So if you were somebody that just you had to put in a ton of reps to express and develop some strength. Right. If you don't keep that stress put onto your body to where, again, you don't have to overdo it, but like it's, to your point, you're not going from 50 to 100, you're going 50 plus one, and then 51 plus one, and then yeah. 52 plus. So if, if you're not doing that constantly, you're gonna see a pretty rapid degradation of your strength. And, and it could happen within a couple of weeks. Like two weeks, you could see 10, 15% drop in your specific strength numbers, right? So now, yeah. something else that I, I, I want to point out is that while it, it kind of can make sense in somebody's head that, you know, more muscle equates to more strength, it, it does, but at a very low level. So you, you do need a certain base level of muscle, mm -hmm. like actual muscle fiber, to develop strength. However, once you pass that, that is actually not the case. And the easiest way to point this out is you look at the outliers. Take the most muscular guys, they are not the strongest guys. And the strongest guys are not the most muscular guys. And right. we're talking specifically about the bodybuilders because they have the most muscular mass, muscle mass of anybody else on the planet. 
than the strongest guys, the ones that are set in powerlifting records. It's not to say that they're not muscular, but they're nowhere near as muscularly as dense as a bodybuilder. And yet, they are significantly stronger, unless you're talking about the one outlier bodybuilder who is also a powerlifter in his prime, Ronnie Coleman. So we're, again, outliers within outliers, right? But if you just take a look at the biggest dudes from a muscular and females to that point, from that perspective, and the strongest, they are not the same people. Lightweight, baby. So, and I remember seeing this play out in the Olympic weightlifting world years ago. Um, two guys, one, um, his name is Spencer Arnold, and another guy, his name was Caleb, oh man, I cannot remember his last name. But anyways, they were both at the time looking, or uh, are, are going to compete at like um, nationals, like one of the national weightlifting meets. They're both in the, I think, the 77 kilo class at the time. And Spencer is built very much like me. So he's tall, he's thin, and Caleb looks like, um, I, I mean, he is about eight inches shorter. And he looks just like a little, little ball of muscle. But they were fighting for the podium position at nationals. Caleb Williams? Caleb Williams, there you go, yeah. So, again, one guy, super long, lean, but just as strong on a pound for pound. And even it wasn't uh, what we would call a sh uh, a strength speed exercise. Or, yeah, it wasn't that. It was a speed strength. It was the Olympic lifts. It wasn't like deadlift squat bench. So it's even more to show that just because somebody is more muscle bound than somebody else doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be stronger. It could, but not necessarily. I remember this one time we were at an Olympic weightlifting meet, and it was at a high school gymnasium, and um, you know the place is full of people, and there was somebody there that wasn't lifting, or maybe he was over the weekend, but um, you pointed at me and said, "Do you know who that is?" And I didn't know who it was. I didn't know his name, and you said pound for pound, and he was he was. I feel like the term little guy is a little bit more demeaning, but it's like he, he was a short, he was a shorter dude. He was not, I mean, he was of course built, he was a weightlifter, and, but he didn't look like some of the people that were lifting there, you know? And you said pound for pound, he is probably the strongest dude in here right now. Yeah, I think it was Harrison, uh, Harrison Morris, maybe, or something maybe, like that. Maybe, yeah. yeah. But you're, Lo you're longer like, hair. I, I think I know who you're talking about. Maybe, yeah. yeah. But you're like pound for pound, that yep. is the strongest dude in here. Um, and I think that goes into the conversation regarding strength as well, but um, it just shows you that, like, yeah, it's about it's about much more than just having a lot of muscle to be strong. Does the muscle help? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, but is it all about that? No. Yeah. I think a, a, another appropriate question in speaking specifically off of hunters here is, okay, so if, if we know that losing muscle and or strength can happen relatively quickly, I think... May, I don't want to say a more appropriate question because that's like saying that's not a, a good question, and it is. I, I think that the next logical question, the offshoot here is, okay, if we know it can happen quickly, how can I stop that? Yeah. Or how can I mitigate it as much as possible? Because I also know specifically with Hunter, you know, and this is what goes into, you know, coaching and not just here's a template of workouts to go and do, right, yeah. is he's got a new baby at home, right? So I'm guessing knowing because I've got two kids of my own and I remember what it was like, but knowing how much your lifestyle changes when those things come in. And I don't even mean from like, oh man, I used to work out five days a week, now I can only work out three. Yeah, but that's like so surface level. Yeah. Like that's Instagram coach worthy, right? <laughs> and then it's like, oh well, your nutrition and you gotta keep your protein up. And again, that's like a, a level two Instagram coach, yeah. right? But the reality is, if, if you if you are, are not taking into account all of the pillars, so your sleep, your eating, your movement, your stress management, if all those things aren't in alignment in terms of just helping you to maintain, if you're not creating an environment to just maintain, then that's where I would actually spend the majority of my effort. So take a look at, okay, what can I do from a movement perspective? What can I commit to from a nutrition perspective? Okay, great. Now, to maximize what I'm doing in those areas, what do I need to do from managing my stress and then sleeping? 
And then if the sleep and the stress management are not enough to support what you're saying you can do from a movement and nutrition perspective, you need to adjust it. And they should all inform and influence one another. You can't just say, oh, I'll work out more. Because if your sleep doesn't support that, because that's the only time that you are actually recovering the way that you should be, yeah. not band-aiding it through a bunch of extra stretching and modalities and supplements, and <laughs> I won't go down that rant, but yeah. so if, you're, if your sleep can't support what you're doing when you're not sleeping, then you got to adjust the things that you're doing when you're not sleeping so that you can support it. Because that's the only way that you're not gonna get into a catabolic state where your body is just chewing its muscle off for energy, right? right? Um, awesome. So that's how quickly a person can lose muscle. Um, and the last 15 minutes is how quickly. Yeah, and, and strength um, as well. Oh, that brings me back to a question I had. You asked, uh, or, or you said that, you know, over maybe a week or two, you might see a 10 to 15% drop in strength. Mm -hmm. How long does it take to rebound from that? Right, because one to two weeks, I like the example of Rob Rivera, like one to two weeks you might see a decline, but I know knowing him, like he can probably bounce back from that rather quickly, like yeah. over the course of X amount of weeks or X amount of months. So like, how do you rebound? So say you can squat 100 pounds, um, and then after two weeks, you're at about 85 to 94, one RM. How long will it take to kind of rebound and bounce back up to that 100, um, 100% capacity or that 100 pound capacity um, for, for like absolute strength, which we'll have to get into. It yeah. depends, yeah. number one. But I, so I, I will say this um, again, go back to what I said about how can I maintain the muscle that I have, right? I, I create the right environment that supports what I can do. So you, you have to do that. In, in terms of how quickly can I get it back, number one is longer than you, actually number one was it depends. Number two is it's longer than you think. And number three, I would say if, if you see a drop within two weeks, I would say that maybe it comes back in another three weeks. So by the fifth week, you could see it come back. Okay. Now, what I will say is the, the longer that you go, without putting a stressor onto the body to at least like keep those fibers and everything stimulated, the, it's, it's like an inverse relationship. Yeah. The longer it's going to take for you to get it back. Wow. So it's like you're, you're sliding backwards on a very slick surface. So it, it's happening quickly, but then it's like you're crawling back to get back to where you were. Ooh, is like that a that. good analogy? Yeah. I think, is that what I'm trying to say? Yeah. So you can backslide really quickly and then going back up is very slow. Yeah, versus if you kind of catch yourself here, right, you can climb up rather yeah. quick. Ooh. That was yeah. a good visual, I like that. So maybe that's a, a good way to think of it. Yeah, cool. Okay, uh, we'll bring that into question number three because we are talking about percentages and stuff like that. Um, yep. It says, uh, why does 70% of my one rep max feel way harder than 100% of my one rep max? Um, like I said, I want to talk to this person because right. I don't know why that's the case. Um, I, I personally, I don't have an answer for it, so I want to hear what you have to yeah. say. Well, I, I think that we're probably of the same mind here is we, we want to talk to this person to get more detail, to, to ask some follow-ups, right? Right. So I don't think that it matters what movement we're talking about. So why does 70% of my one rep feel way harder than 100% of my one rep? So the first thing that I would want to know is when did you last test your one rep max? Oh yeah. Right? Because if, if you get, yeah, to your point, that's probably the last time I tested some one rep maxes. If, if you tested, you know, your one rep max, you know, let's just say it was 100 pounds and it was four years ago, and you're going back to the last two points that we've made, your training, your, everything else has not looked like it did four years ago, but let's say you're still healthy, so that's not a, a reason but it has not looked like it. So you've not continued to adapt. So you've 
slid back. Um, and now you look at, you say, well, today you come in and it says 70%, you're gonna do you know, one or two or however many reps. 70% would be 70 pounds, it's easy math, and you go and you do a rep or two and you're like, holy crap, this is way harder than I remember my one rep max being, Yeah. right? So I think there's, there's probably some of that, you know, I would ask this person, when did you last test it? What have you been doing since then? I'm, I'm not trying to make an assumption, but I would make a educated guess that that's probably some of what's going on here is they're looking at one rep from months, years ago, and thinking that they still have the same level of strength in that movement that they did years ago. So they're like, well, I could do 100, I should be able to do 70. Yeah, but you, if you haven't been supportive of that adaptation, then all bets are off because of what we know about strength and muscle mass loss. Right. Right? Um, so yeah, the, the other thing is, are you just doing the 70% for one rep? That wouldn't make sense in my mind, but maybe. Um, are you doing it for reps? So doing 10 reps at 70 very well may be in your mind, however you process these things harder than doing 100% for one rep. There's a whole lot more time under tension, depending upon your training age, that just may be way harder for you. And just in terms of an effort and all that, people that are younger in training age, they can get strong really, really fast. So that could have an impact on it. So there's, there's just a whole lot more that I would want to know about this person with regards to that question. Yeah, it brings me back to a conversation you and I had years ago about how there was this games athlete and she was following a certain um, program and, and she said on video, and you guys can go find a video, I won't name drop, but it says something like, oh, our, uh, um, you know, my 10 rep max is the same as my one rep max. Yeah, it's, it's like a few percentage rep. points underneath that. Yeah, yeah. and then we, had somebody here that for some time, for quite a few years, was under the same program mm -hmm. and said the same thing. Like had very, very similar one rep max and 10 rep max weights. So like you said, it was maybe within like five to 10%, right. which is just unheard, right? right? You should be able to do 10 at, I mean, what's the highest percentage you think you could do 10 at as a, of like your one rep max? 70, Two, no, seventy-five. You see higher than that, um, but I mean, not a whole lot higher. You might get into eighties, but again, but you're not training like ninety-four, like right. ninety-five, right? Yeah. Um, and so it it brings me back to again, like, what are you doing to maintain that one rep max strength? Like, if you're training for a ten rep max, then you're gonna get good at ten rep max, right? If you're not training for a one rep max, your one rep max like might budge, like you might see some adaptation from whatever you're doing for the 10 rep max. But as we'll, we'll kind of get into this with the next question is like, that's the difference between absolute strength operating in this specific energy system for upwards of eight to 10 seconds at a maximum or operating at um, in a completely different energy system using a completely different source of energy in terms of like muscle endurance. So um, that's mm -hmm. kind of like the, the, what this question kind of brought me back to that conversation we had about like a 10 rep max and a 1 rep max, a 70% and a 100% of like, of like a 1 RM. Right. So a lot of it can be due to like the certain training that you're doing. Right. Say, say you do a 1 rep max and then you don't go above like 70 or 75% for 12 or a 16 week cycle. Like, it's probably your one rep max is still probably going to feel very heavy like your previous one rep max because you're not training to you weren't really training to improve it despite being at a relatively like high percentage i say that's more like a moderate percentage but right you get really good at those moderate weights yeah the other thing too to consider is what were the tempo that what's the tempo that you were using for these these reps, yeah. and, and, and again, I said, how many reps were you doing? But also within that is the tempo. And I'm thinking about what you were asking me during the front squats today is what was harder, 
the because I was doing the five sets of eight with no tempo, it was just at my own versus the seven sets of five. Was it seven sets of five? Last, yes. last week, so seven sets of five where if you were two seconds down, one second pause, quick it up, so let's just call it a second, and then another second before you start and it, or before you initiate the next movement. And I said that I thought that the ones with the tempo were far harder than the ones without the tempo. And ironically, I was doing more reps today than I was last week. Yeah. But again, I think of this from a uh, time under tension standpoint. So last week, when I was doing the tempo, five seconds per repetition times five reps is 25 seconds where I am under tension. Today, each rep took approximately two seconds, 16 seconds. So even though it was more reps, time under tension was nine seconds less. So more than 50% less time under tension wow. today than last week. Yeah. So there's that to kind of consider too. Very cool. Yeah. So all that to say, there's a lot more detail that we need from that. Yeah. But good question. I think that brings us right into the next one too. This is our fourth um, and final question for today. And something I kind of already touched on is what's the difference between absolute strength and muscular endurance? So um, pretty good question. Two completely different, I would say, attributes of physical expression. Ooh. Yeah. yeah. So, yes. Um, Josh, what's the difference between absolute strength and muscular endurance? So in the continuum of progression in fitness, absolute strength is, let's just say, uh, let's just say it's like step four or five, whereas muscle endurance is two. So it's like, I, I gotta do motor control movements, which is just understanding how to move and ingraining the pattern into my brain, right? And then after I do that is, okay, I, I want to be able to do it, you know, for repetition. So that's like muscular endurance. And then the next one is like strength endurance and then absolute strength, okay? Absolute strength, the best way to think of this is the most amount of weight that you can lift one time. One time. For a maximal contraction. Got it. So there's a barbell on the ground. I'm gonna load it up with as much weight that allows me to only pick it up one time, and I'm done. So we would say a one rep max. Okay. okay? Um, same thing for pressing something overhead. It, it's it's all the same from a resistance training perspective. Is the absolute strength is just a, a singular muscular contraction, right? You can even do this with a bicep curl or a tricep press press down, right, on a cable machine. Yeah. So. You can express absolute strength in a, just a plethora of, of different movements. Um, and it, it's not limited by your muscle's ability to continue contracting. You're just asking it to contract one time, okay? When we, we go back a little bit, muscle endurance is your body's ability to repeat with no fatigue a contraction over and over and over and over. So the simplest thing that I can give to folks to think about is, can you go walk for an hour? That's muscle endurance. That's muscle endurance. Can you jog for an hour? Most people know. And, and, I, and, and remember, we said without becoming fatigued. Yeah. So it's very dependent upon uh, what the modality is. So you may have great muscle endurance for the walking, poor muscle endurance for the jogging or the running, right? You're right. So you, to, to develop muscle endurance, you do look, just like with anything, it's like, you wouldn't expect it because you can deadlift 400 pounds that you can press 400 pounds. So you, why would you expect it because you can walk for an hour that you can run for an hour? There are two different modalities. They may look the same, and maybe the deadlift and press is a, is a poor uh, comparison, so maybe we say deadlift to power clean. They start off very similar to one another, but they are very different movements. Same thing, walk to run. So muscle endurance is being able to repeat a movement pattern over and over and over without getting tired. And then as you progress through that, you develop strength in the movement and then strength endurance to be able to repeat it, right? So. 
within the gym, some of the things that you can think of that are easy to see from a muscular endurance standpoint is cyclical work is like the, the very basics. So can you get on the skier again, do 500 cows an hour, you know, for 30 minutes? Can you maintain that muscular endurance? So there's repetition over and over and over and over, right? So that's the difference is like you're asking in muscle endurance to repeat a contraction without fatigue for a specified amount of time. Absolute strength, there's a heavy thing. I lift heavy thing one time. Yeah. Um, so that's when we talk about like just the, the definition, like what is it, the yeah. difference between them. Um, is there anything you would add to kind of help people no, no, that's good. And I like the example you use because in my head I always think muscle endurance and it goes back to, you know, when, we, when I was in school two, two and a half, three years ago, um, when we were learning about this, I kind of just gave that ballpark. I don't really remember when we learned about it, but uh, it, strength is, you know, there, there are typical guidelines through research that we've discovered as, as a species that you can stick to these guidelines and you're going to improve absolute strength. And then there are certain guidelines, and by guidelines I mean like sets, reps, tempo, rest, and load um, that you can stick to that's going to improve your muscular endurance. And I like that you, instead of like relating it to sets and reps, like I guess you could break a walk or a jog down to that, right? So, but that's what muscle endurance is, is like. Are you able to walk for an hour without being fatigued, without being like, ooh, okay, I gotta sit down and rest, right? That means your muscles can endure, right? You you have the endurance in those muscles. But I guess just to kind of add it and break it down is like, think absolute strength, like you said, meat pick heavy weight up one time. Mm -hmm. um, you're training at 80 to 85 plus percent of your max. You're doing between one and three reps and you're resting for three or four minutes between your set, right? right. And you, that is very, um, that's what you're doing. Muscle endurance is you're anywhere from, like you're at a much lower percentage, you're at a very lightweight, you're doing three to five sets of 12 to 15 plus reps with 30 seconds of rest, yeah. right? So right. if you can kind of like get those numbers, like if you're a numbers person and all those made sense in your head, just listening to that, you know that those are two completely different stimuli that you're going to be feeling doing yeah. either. And one, the former is going to be developing absolute strength. The latter is going to aid in muscular endurance. Relating it back to what you said um, for, um, you know, a job, right? Say you're doing like a tempo run, like a three minutes of hard running, one minute of resting. Or just say like you're going for an hour worth of a job or a walk. Like you're doing one rep every third of a second, right, for an hour. Yeah. Like that's, like, so your rest is a third of a second between, yes. or less than that, because if you're running at 180 beats per minute, like, you're always, like, there is that little intra-workout rest period, but it's a third of a second, right? Because it's while very you're, very minimal. Yeah, while you're waiting for the next step to take place, like, that's another way to think about it. Um, so very little rest, very high repetition, very low weight. Yes. Um, there's a note in there, strength progresses disproportionately to muscular endurance. Yeah, so I did clarify this. They were asking, do the two progress differently? So meaning, is it easier to gain absolute strength than it is to gain muscle endurance? And it depends. <laughs> that should be the name of the podcast. It yeah. depends. Um, it depends, let's just put it this way, it depends upon your genetic makeup. Again, going back to using Rob as the example, yeah. he's, he's going to gain absolute strength pretty quickly relative to gaining muscle endurance, right? Right. If you are, you know, there, there are no power lifters that look like they run marathons. Nope. And there are no marathoners who look like they can deadlift 400 pounds. Nope. Right? So a marathoner, just by their genetics, are going to be, and I always get them confused, like the type 1, type 2 fibers or whatever. I think it's type 1 that are uh, very uh, mus muscle endurance, yes. like favorable, right? Yes. So they're going to be very high in those 
uh, muscle fibers that favor being an enduring individual. So, and that's just something they're born with. Like yeah. it's, it's not like you can go and get yeah. like type one implants right. if you want to get better at like running, <laughs> right? Like give me those calves implants, like Jay Scott asked. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but yes. yeah, but uh, yeah, that's just something you're born with. Correct. So if you are somebody like that, muscle endurance is is going to come easier to you. But it's also within within just because this is very specific to like the working out in the gym fitness population. Think of all the different exercises that in your head that you can think think off the top of your head, and then multiply it by like a hundredfold because that's probably how many that you could come up with if you really sat down and thought about it. Yeah, um, they're all going to have different rates of adaptation, and I know people don't like to hear that because it's like, oh well, my front squat progressed at this rate, so my overhead squat should, or my deadlift should, or you know, my, I'm good at this running, so like I should be able to translate that to the assault bike. And it's like, no, everything is is different. Yeah. And one of the beautiful things that CrossFit did give is this whole mixing of modalities together. But one of the, the problems is that when people come over from a strength and conditioning background is they will use some of the same templates that you use in endurance training and think that that is how you're going to get better at mixed modal training. And it doesn't translate because endurance training is single modality. They are super dialed in at how to get great at cycling for the Tour de France because you know what they work on? Cycling. Yeah. They don't mix cycling with handstands, with deadlifts, with box jumps and pull-ups. They freaking ride their bikes. Now I know somebody out there is like, yeah, but they cross train and they do do strength training. <laughs> Just no, you, you don't know what you're talking about. I'm not saying that they don't do that, but as a percentage of what they're doing, it might as well be nothing. They're great at cycling because they cycle all the time. Right. And that's what it takes, right? So um, it, you can't just think that, oh, um, because I, for me, for me pull-ups, I can do pull-ups for days, big sets of pull-ups. Like, I think my max set might be somewhere in the mid to high 50s. Wow. Nowhere near that on push-ups. I just cannot do them. You know, from a muscular endurance perspective, my pull-ups are far better than my push-ups are. But that doesn't mean that um, I look at, oh, I'm not going to be able to do this because my push-ups. It's just, no, th this is just a different thing, you know? Yeah. Just, it... You have to you have to silo those things, and I know that's hard because then it goes back to the well, it depends answer, and that's why we say you know sit with the coach and talk about it because if you can want to improve fifty things, but we need to get down to okay, let's let's focus on this one thing first. Let's measure where you are, and then we can work forward. A lot of it can come down to energy systems training too, and that's something that we were talking about a little bit in the last question we touched on very briefly but I remember there was this like famous video of Chris Henshaw and you guys don't know Chris Henshaw he was like the I don't know if he's still with them but he was like the like CrossFit endurance coach um, uh, no because CrossFit uh, did away completely with all their subject matter expert courses and people okay so he's not fired all those guys along with their media team and uh, threw a bomb and all kinds of other things yeah. anyways some clownery going on there some he's there. still very present in the community he does his own thing um, where he takes endurance to the, the functional fitness community yeah yeah sorry so go he, ahead no that's good uh, he um, said in a video once that he was talking about Rich Froning and he said I could have Rich Froning test his back squat and then put him on a running program for X amount of time, you know, a six week running program. And at the end of the six weeks, he would test his back squat and he would get better. Like you'd see an increase in his back squat. And there's part of me that's like, well, I mean, it makes sense, right? You're using the same body parts, but if you're not training that absolute strength and you're training that muscle endurance, you're most likely not gonna see that great of an adaptation. On the flip side, maybe if Froney was only doing sprints in the eight to 10 second range mm -hmm. to on that running program, you might see a greater increase or a greater adaptation in 
his back squat, despite not doing back squats for six weeks, only because of that energy systems training um, that you're seeing at that certain set and rep range. So yeah. for example, like for absolute strength, I keep saying eight to 10 seconds, you're operating in a system that does not go past eight to 10 seconds, right? Correct. You are using creatine as a source of energy to lift that weight. Right. After that, you move into, I'm gonna get it wrong, but it's, it's um, glycolytic, but in the absence of oxygen, correct? Up until like 30 seconds. Yeah. And yep. then, yep. or up until like two and a half yeah, minutes. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be about two and a half minutes. Give or take. Minutes. Yeah, I mean, it's because, hard to pinpoint, but yeah. Because I heard some people say that at 30 seconds, like something else it changes until it becomes like glycolytic, like with that, whatever. So up until the two and a half minute range is when you're not, you're still not using oxygen, right? But now you're calling on um, carbohydrates, right? Yeah. So, and then afterwards is where two and a half plus minutes is now you're getting oxidative, right? So you're using oxygen. That's really where you're operating at for muscle endurance, mm -hmm. right? That's that five sets of five to, or you know, twelve to fifteen reps with thirty seconds. Like that's where you're looking at muscle endurance. Um, so that's literally physiologically what's happening is you're using creatine or you're using oxygen for um, uh, energy production. Energy production. Right. So the point I'm kind of drawing is maybe if you and I were to do sprints twice a week for six weeks we would see an increase in our back squat. Um, but you know what we would probably have to do the most of to see an increase in our back squat? And that's back squat, yeah. right? Yeah. It's not long runs. You don't long run to get better at back squatting. You don't do 10 rep maxes to get better at your one rep max. You train what you are trying to improve. Yeah. And if that is life, then figure out what that is in life, whether it's a walk or whether it's long aerobic 40, 45, 50 minute work to get better at that. Yeah, there's, there's long been this stigma in the strength and conditioning world that concurrent training cannot happen. And what I mean by that is you can't simultaneously improve your, and we're just taking like two opposite ends of the spectrum. You can't improve your muscle endurance, your endurance, and your top end strength at the same time. The belief being that a pursuit of one sacrifices the other. So if I want to improve my endurance, my strength numbers are gonna go down. Vice versa, if I want to improve, if I pursue strength gains, my endurance is going to get worse. And that's just not the case. Concurrent yeah. training certainly does exist, but it's different for every person. So like for me, if I go out and do a lot of endurance training that encompasses a lot of eccentric contraction, meaning running is very eccentric heavy, if people didn't know that it is, um, it could depress the strength, possible strength adaptation that I would get while I'm still trying to gain strength. It doesn't mean that I won't. However, to your point, if you want the maximal adaptation in something, then you need to have that singular focus. Like, could, could a, a Tour de France cyclist um, get good at cycling if they added some sort of strength training. Yeah, they, they, they might see some, some adaptation, but not as much as if they just solely focus on their cycling. Right. Right? So, it, concurrent training, yeah, that's, that's what we do all the time. But understanding that we're not building power lifters, we're not building endurance people, Really, we're, we're not building athletes of any kind. We're just developing humans in order to function in their day-to-day -day more than more than anything. Uh, point to, to kind of maybe send people away with on this is yeah. that, and I, I had no idea that I was going to go here, but just, just some food for thought. And you were talking about the, the different energy systems. And it's worth mentioning that it's not like one energy system comes on and then it shuts off and then the next one comes on. Like they're all on, all, and I know you know that, but just for people listening, yeah, yeah. we know that. Um, and they're all on at all times. It's just what is the dominant energy source at the time, depending upon what, what you were doing at that moment. So the, the CP system, the, the creatine phosphate system that you were talking about is like the high power, you know, I'm, I'm doing a strength movement, I'm doing a power thing or something like that. 
And then the other side of the spectrum is the very oxidative. That's where, you know, the, the reason that uh, steady state, low intensity cardio has been out there for so long is that actually is when you are burning fat to do that, like in the presence of oxygen, that is what's happening. Yeah. The funny part though is most of us, um, if, if you come from a CrossFit high intensity type background um, and you sit in that middle zone all the time, to your point, what was it that is fueling that is carbohydrate. carbohydrate. What's another uh, word for carbohydrate? What is a carbohydrate? The devil. It is a sugar. <laughs> right? Hmm. So, just tossing this out there. All the things that we know about sugar, how sustainable do you think, or how healthy do you think it is to do training that as time progresses and you progress in that, um, that you are doing something that necessitates an increase in sugar consumption to adapt over time? What do you think your body's going to crave after it? Yeah, what, 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 what do you need to actually maintain that that exercise? Sugar. Yeah. So just so. just some food for thought. You know. Ha, no pun intended. Yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah, so to, to to recap, we talked about the differences for a while and they 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 progress differently based upon your internals, right? Yeah. Like if you're a just a naturally raw, strong person, that's going to adapt quicker than the marathon runner and, and vice versa. Right. But depending upon within your body, because everybody's an individual uniquely, within your body, you're going to see differences. So while the marathoner may be very good at the running, it, you can't it, expect the, the similar adaptation period of time when they get on the skier or the rower. Yeah. So, yeah. That's good stuff, man. I, I really hope that we get some questions branching off of that because there's so much that we can cover in terms of like the genetics yeah. and like fibers and how to develop. Like, I, I love all that stuff, the physio physiology stuff. So, um, yeah, send us your questions after listening to this because I'm sure a lot of you guys will have some, some of you dedicated listeners. So, that's right. Let us know. Cool. That's all I got. That's it for today. Uh, today, what's today? Today's the 16th. All right. What episode number? Uh, episode number 79. Ooh. So two weeks is the 30th. That'll be episode number 80. 80. All right. 80. I guess uh, I'm going to spread this chair off with the bottle of clothes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. As always, guys, uh, if you're listening on iTunes and the five-star review, it really helps us out to get the podcast heard.